The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of the streaming platforms, public access channels, the Kitty Rose lifestyle, or the program underwriters. Tim's on my feet, stomping out the negativity. Everybody not a friend of me. Spread the love, still I move deliberately. Boy, face on, but the smile be heavenly. Brooklyn girl, so they love the energy. Love sincerity, so I take the liberty to take them on a journey lyrically. Through hallways and alleys. <laughs> hey, everyone. And welcome back to this week's episode of The Next Chapter, where we discuss shades of gray. I am your host, Minister Cat, AKA Kitty Rose. And I am excited to bring to you guys our second guest co-host. And what's special about this guest co-host is he's actually related to me. He's my first cousin who I've never met in person. So let's welcome my first cousin, Li cousin Lionel Bailey. What's good, everybody? Let's come forward to it. Hey. What's up? What's good? What's going and, on, baby? Hey, baby. Hey, cuz. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. Doing good. Doing wonderful. Everyone, not only are we first cousins, but we are both 74 babies. So this is our 49th year. We're about to turn 50 next year. And we are related by his mama and my daddy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sure. But I was right. raised by my mama's people, and he was raised by his daddy's people. So... <laughs> 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 but we have connected online, and one of the reasons why I think the Spirit has connected us is because in this huge family that both of us are in, we are both servants of, of Christ, of, of the Creator. We are both in the ministry. So I welcome him, Chaplain Bailey. He said, don't call him that. He said, just call him Lionel. So I welcome my first cousin, <laughs> Lionel Bailey, everyone. And we're gonna get right into today's topic because since we are both in ministry, I thought today's topic should be the new age of ministry. <laughs> That's our topic of the week, the new age of ministry. When you got that, when you, when I sent that to you, cause what, what was the first thing that you thought of? What came to your mind? First thing I thought about, first of all, Hey, it's, it's so good to be in your virtual presence. All right. <laughs> so, um, I'm super excited about, you know, us connecting in this way and looking forward to more opportunities to connect. And uh, so the first thing that came to my mind was um, artificial intelligence. Mm. <laughs> that was the first thing that came to my mind. So if, any, if, if no one's tracking about where ministry is headed, where ministry is going, uh, as it relates to artificial intelligence and its impact on ministry, then you're missing a boat. Okay. Well, I saw that episode a couple of weeks ago that you did on yeah. IA, uh, but that's not where I was going. But you're right, because in the new age of ministry, it is a constant reinvention as everything else in life. But when I thought about the new age of ministry, I thought about people that look like you and I, who weren't necessarily the average ministers or the average messengers that people were getting the, the message or ministry from. And I know when we mm. talked about uh, what this show was going to be about, I told you, as I tell everyone, I'm not here to convert anyone. My life is my testimony, and I use what I've learned and what I'm learning on my journey to help others come closer to Jehovah God. And, and, and because it's benefited me, you know, I made the joke that maybe it could benefit them as well. So, you know, I use my testimony, but then you gave me your kind of story and journey into ministry, which was, you know, from the youth, sidetracked it like many of us, and then the Spirit brought you back, but differently than how you were raised in the church. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest with you, I was sort of the black sheep of my immediate family. So um, no one expected me to have any in impact on at, at the level that I have now with, with, you know, reaching thousands of people all over the world, all the time across, uh, across the country and internationally. So, um, but I was the last one that anyone thought 
would have that kind of impact. Mm -hmm. And so I'm definitely, you know, an individual that people just didn't see coming. Mm. Well, when I was doing the research for this show, I wasn't really getting the kind of footage I wanted. So I went to your YouTube channel and I actually found <laughs> how I wanted to shape this conversation and kind of introduce the world to how you came into this journey of, of, of your relationship with Christ and then tie that into my journey and then we could kind of, you know, chop it up afterwards. So let me take you guys to this first video, which is, like I said, on your a YouTube channel, which is Word for Change Podcast. And I, I, I love the way that you put this, a pastor's perspective on YouTube content creation. <laughs> because, you know, that's that's another Sodom and Gomorrah. So how do we, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> navigate in that matrix? So I thought that was a nice pun on words. But it says, a pastor turned YouTube a pastor turned YouTuber. And I noticed, like, in your, like, I know how to edit, but I ain't that fancy. So let's check <laughs> out, let's check out a little clip of his intro video and then chop it up when we come back. <sighs> this video is not about me or what I can do. It's about why we do what we do, those we sacrifice for, to have a better tomorrow. This video is for my 24 subscribers. I hope you know that I appreciate you. Today I had a thought and it felt kind of awkward. I thought about why I spent so much time on YouTube and why it is that, that I spend time editing YouTube videos. I thought about time. I thought about energy that I spent away from what matters most. I thought about the many other things I could be doing instead of editing videos. It made me think about why am I wasting my time doing these things? Why I'm wasting time recording videos? Why am I spending money on equipment that I possibly may not even use in the future? And then I thought about why did I decide to record YouTube videos? Did you really need YouTube videos. But what brought me to this point that I started to record videos and why is it important? Let me answer that question this way. I started out as a pastor for over 20 years ago, trained as a practical theologian. And after 20 years and some change of studying and researching and being in classes and being in church ministry, and I've, I've landed on something that I felt was deeply important. And it was deeply important for me to bring balance to what I had observed in churches, I have had observed for years the things that I saw in churches, and I felt that there was a deep need for balance, and I didn't quite know how I would communicate that balance or how I would help other people to see that balance, but I felt this deep pull and push to give a different perspective to the Christian gospel than what I had been hearing on television and personal stories in my community and communities like mine. After so many years of thinking and working through these processing and stuff, I thought the church just needs balance. For every prosperity gospel preacher, there needs to be preachers who are out giving their lives so that people can have a safer environment, clean running water. I thought about the farm preachers out in the country who care more about how you treat people than they do about how many degrees you have. I thought about and pastors who were taking care of their communities and building deep rooted relationships spirituality for them was not coming to church and putting on any kind of show or likes camera action but them helping people wash clothes or helping fix a car of a neighbor of a neighbor down the street or helping babysit for a single mom for for every preacher who was you know asking for money or every story that i heard about a pastor who had taken advantage of a parishioner. I, I wanted to give a perspective that there were equally individuals who were, who were doing hard work in their community and were not getting paid or making much money, that they had mounts of student loan debt only to make $40,000 a year, if that, with a $100,000 student loan debt so that they could serve a local community. I wanted people to know about why Dr. Martin Luther King did what he did, who earned his doctorate degree before he was 30 years old, and instead of you know serving as a professor or doing some of the other great things he could have done because he was a smart young man that he decided to give his life to a purpose that was greater than himself, which ultimately led him to losing his life before he was 40 years old. So what was, I wanted people to know what theological processing had he went through to make that kind of sacrifice. I wanted people to know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the confessing church 
who fought against Nazi Germany and felt even though they were he was a pacifist had become known as a pacifist he felt the need that his Christian witness was that he fight against Nazism and felt that it was his Christian duty to do so. I wanted people to know about that. I wanted people to, to know that what you see on television is not a total representation of what the church is all about. I wanted people in the world to see that they had a place in the church. Not a total representation. Good job. First of all, your graphics is bananas. Like I said, I ain't that fancy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. But thank I, you. And shout out to your 24 subscribers then, because I'm sure right. it's maybe, what, 29 now? Wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> it's grown a little bit. <laughs> but shout out hey, to... Hey. to <laughs> yeah, so, Je I mean, you know, uh, now that I look at that, it's so funny, right? But, uh, you know, I, at that time, I was being uh, really vulnerable about mm. why I decided to come into that space, right? Because that wasn't intention. My were never to go on YouTube, you know, was just to do the podcast. And so it, it just snowballed into other things. And so that's that's really what that video was getting at. Like, it was a spiritual transformation for me going from, okay, you know, showing up on these platforms and doing things because other people are doing them Instead of like, why are you showing up? Are you being mm -hmm. authentically yourself? So, right. yeah, yeah. I know that was for me, like not necessarily conforming to the way everybody else was doing things, but finding my rhythm or finding what worked for me to use this platform as a way of giving my ministry again as a testimony to others. Not necessarily doing it the way everyone else was doing it. Like I said, even looking at your graphics, I know things are important for us to add in and imagery is all important, but you know, sometimes, you know, we, 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 I won't say get lazy, but we just we, we know what our lane is. And when we know what our yeah. lane is, then we, we we move accordingly. So I enjoyed, you know, that introduction to what you were talking about in regards to balance. And I think that that's mm. what stuck stuck out for me when I came back into my ministry. When I came back into my service, I knew that mm. I needed a level of balance because my foundation had never shook. You know, I was raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and I've kind of mm. carried that foundation throughout my whole life. But things that bothered me, very simple things that bothered me was very much like imagery, you know, and, and, and why, you know, maybe something as simple as, but wasn't simple as Jesus Christ depicted as uh, a white man rather than, you know, mm. a, a man of color. You know what I'm saying? Not even necessarily black, but someone of darker skin that was uh, raised in that region that he was raised, that he was born in, and the climate of the skin of that uh, of those people. So things like that kind of started to make me. I recently put on social media that my faith or my love for Jehovah is not what I question, but I question mm. the messengers in over years and what their purpose in wanting to control me mm. and, and how that might have now doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel like a balance. You know, I, yeah. I, I learned that I serve a logical God. And when I learned that I served a logical God and I, and I was taught that I'm different from the animals because I don't move on instinct, I move on lo logic, thinking about something, like you were saying, local help in the community. Like, I don't yeah. have to be, you don't have to be a Baptist to help a Baptist. You don't have to be a Jehovah right. Witness to help, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I right. didn't understand right. why things weren't happening just on a local community level unless you were in this particular organization. And I think what happened is that other folks started to think about things like that, and that started mm. drawing people away from the church which then started drawing people away from God and not even right. them realizing it, but them wanting to detach themselves from the preacher not doing this or the congregation not doing this. They just kind of like got caught up in the matrix of life and well, left I mean, their and, connection. Right. right. Well, he, here's an important thing to, to keep in mind that there's, there's two different churches. Okay. <laughs> there is the church of man and the church of the creator. Tell it. Okay. So, so, <laughs> Well, you know what? The reason why a lot of people get jaded mm -hmm. is because they put a lot of faith in the church of man. Yes. And and when I began to realize that there was a difference, it was a bishop that said to me, I was at a training. This was years ago. It was a training about social justice. And, and I was a, a part of that training. And during a conversation, I brought up to the bishop that I had become disenchanted with mm. what I was seeing happening in church leadership. Mm. 
and uh, he noticed my frustration. And he and after the meeting, he pulled me aside and he says, "Look, I want to tell you one thing. You got to keep this in mind. As a young minister, there's a difference between a church of God and a church of man." Okay. Mm -hmm. And I and that resonated with me for many. That was probably almost 20 years ago that was said to me. Okay. So what I begin to what I begin to take from that was that there is, when you see people who are in leadership positions who are doing things that may question what you would, be con what you would consider ethically correct or, or right, mm -hmm. um, that's just speaking to their humanity. Mm. It's speaking to the fact that people are going to be people no matter who they are and no matter where they come from. The problem is when people who do not consider themselves to be righteous or holy or any of these kind of, you know, religious words that we throw around, mm -hmm. they superimpose mm -hmm. that those who are in those spaces, right, right mm -hmm. are going to have a higher ethical perspective and, and lifestyle. They presuppose that. So right. when those individuals disappoint them, right. they become disenchanted right. and kind of want to disconnect. Right. And so, and they want to disconnect from the church and from God, because they locate God, I mean, totally within the context of right, the church. Right, right, right. And that's problematic. And I think what we're seeing now is that we're seeing people who's, who are starting to see that you can dislocate God from the church. And I'm mm. not saying like the destruction of the church. Right, right. But not God is not only in the four walls or in that institution of the church. Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah. I always yeah. say that I don't preach perfection. I preach the mercy of God because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do my best to stay on that righteous road and I, and I do well with it. But when I fall and I, and I sin because I do, I, what I do is I repent and move accordingly in that repentance to do better. I don't say, you know, oh, well, Father God, you know, here it is. And then I go back and do it again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I work yeah. towards being better because the scriptures also say, faith without works is dead. So when I ask right. for forgiveness, I make sure that I do the work in, for, in repentance because I know that I am still a sinner. So I say that to people because don't look at me because I have insight and in understanding scripture that mm -hmm. I am perfect. Let's check out right. our first PSA of the evening. Every day thousands of kids start vaping. And I can't let this happen to my kid. Of course, it's awkward to talk to your kids about the dangers of vaping. Hey, bestie. How sketch is me? It's hard to get their attention. Ready? Go. Yes. Look at that. Yeah, you, you, you didn't turn yours over. So if you want to talk to your kids about the dangers of vaping, you have to get it trending. Right, backpack kid? Let's do it. First, invite your kid to do the vape talk. Let's try this. All right. Why is he here? Yeah, I gotta get it trending, no. honey. Come on. Visit talkaboutvaping.org for tips on when and how to have the vape talk. I wanted to ask you, Lionel, what do you love about your service of ministry? People. Oh. I love working with the people. Okay. Uh, ministry is about people. Uh, the moment, the moment I get away from focusing on of the people, mm. the moment I get away from the reason why I was called to do ministry in the first place, right? Mm. That's a very, very important part. A lot of times it becomes very easy to disassociate from the people because of what the title or what ministry provides, the, the visibility it provides. But it's it's all about the people. And, and when I talk about people, I'm talking about people who look like me and people who don't look like me, people who believe like me and those who don't believe like me. I have friends who are Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu. I have friends all over the religious map. And they are truly my friends. I have friends who are gay, straight. I have friends all over the map. And so my job is to help be the antidote wow. to the sickness that they are experiencing. To, to help be the healer to the pain that they're going through, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from. 
And so uh, just, you know, going back to that previous video real quick, the reason why I talked about Martin King and Dietrich Bonhoeffer is because these people had status. These people had everything that most young preachers, young ministers desire, which is influence. Mm -hmm. But they decided to turn that influence mm -hmm. uh, into an opportunity to actually create change, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if we're not in the business of creating change, right? Something's wrong. Jesus was a revolutionary who yes. created change. Mm -hmm. Martin was a revolutionary, right? I can say Malcolm was a revolutionary, right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a revolutionary. These were people who cut against the grain, right? Even lost influence because they had a deeper belief in who and what they were called to do and be. Mm -hmm. And so you can't do and be without interacting with people, right? Because that's how the, the gospel in my, in my perspective works. It works in and through the lives of people. So, yeah. So how were you able to do that as a chaplain? Because I've always uh, had a love-hate relationship with that calling. Because I understand mm -hmm. the need for that, you know, but then you're in such a, like, you. I, I'm hoping that you weren't in any type of war situation, but every time I think about, like, MASH, you know what I'm saying, and I think about the chaplain yeah. and that, I think about how crucial having or feeling God in that presence of turmoil, but then the fight with yourself in, in the killing <laughs> that's being done all around you at the same time. Like, were, were you ever at a battle with yourself doing both or being those for others? Because you were you were almost like this um, spiritual confidant for people of high ranking in the military. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's a constant issue, right? Um, it's it's a, what you're asking is a moral question, right? Okay. Yes. How does your more right? How does your morality function in a mil military industrial complex? How does your morality function in a, in a system that is focused on, you know, defense and proliferating its power and projection around the world? And uh, there's, a, there's a, a term that we use in the Navy Chaplain Corps, and it's called strategic presence, right? So my job is to not serve the institution mm. as much as, as it is to serve the people. So my job is not to be, even though I am an officer and I have certain things that I must abide by legally, but ministerially, the institution has given me the, the right to speak into the lives and into the circumstances and situations of a particular unit that I'm involved in. Okay. So if there's injustice, wrong, if people are not being treated fairly, the, the institution has given me the right to speak up and say something about it, right? To advocate on behalf for, of, of the people. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a, you know, my, one of my Buddhist chaplains helped me understand that years mm -hmm. ago as I dealt with my struggle okay. with that. And it's always a struggle, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's definitely a mission that has to be accomplished, right. but you can't accomplish the mission without the people, right? right. Uh, no people, no, no mission. So, how do you, how do I function? Well, it's number one, I maintain my spiritual grounding, my centering. I never lose the fact that I am a man of God. I am a man of a higher being. I'm a man of a higher power. I am the antidote to the sicknesses of this world. That's what I've been invested. And so wherever I find myself, I maintain that I am a man of God. Mm -hmm. I, am a, I am that person that speaks light brings light in the middle of darkness, that brings life in the middle of death, <laughs> that brings life in the middle of hopelessness. Ooh. So uh, the, the, moment that I, the moment that I'm not doing that, I'm not worth it. If, if the military can get me to shut my mouth all the time, <laughs> then I'm not worth my salt, okay. right? And real chaplains understand that. So okay. uh, that, that's one of the blessings that, that people, you know, maybe not really understand about chaplains in the military. But hopefully what I've shared with you gives a little bit more clarity to that piece, yeah. It definitely gave more clarity to me because I kind of figured that's where it had to be 
you know, but yeah. it's never the same hearing it from the horse's mouth directly, you know, because we don't get those opportunities to ask those questions directly, mm. you know. We have those questions. We watch TV. Like I said, I, I mash is, is the first thing that comes to my mind, but all we do is in our house be like, well, I wonder how he dealt with that, or how could he do that, or, you know, is it really, like, it's almost like when people go to confession, you know, is it really yeah. resonating with them? Are they just kind of, like, grasping at straws because because they're in such a, 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 termite, a, a traumatic state? Or is it really also bringing comfort to those that also have the internal battle that they have? Because, again, you know, it, it's not a war-type situation all the time, but you being right. a spiritual confidant, you being a spiritual guide, is also, I'm sure, um, having people throw up on you with their own, you know, turmoils that they're going through inside. So one of the things that I also did in my research when I was uh, stalking your content was I saw a video <laughs> that um, resonated with me because this is where I'm at right now. Like I said, I don't, mm. I don't challenge the belief of the creator, but mm. I challenge certain things that I was raised to believe, or even things that I hear now as an adult. Like, I constantly hear people say, you know, when someone dies, well, that was God's plan, you know, or mm. when some, or even, uh -oh. or even when we say, because I've said, you know, it's already, it's already in motion, it's already planned. Like, I believe in the power of manifestation. Mm. However, if everything was already planned, did, did that, did God then know we were going to sin? So I, 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 you know what I'm saying? I have this thing about <laughs> now that I'm surrounded by death, you know, I have this thing about like, well, what actually happens? You know, I, I was raised to believe that when we die, you know, that the, we go to nothing, but we have the hope of resurrection. But then some people believe, well, is resurrection right here a mental thing that we have to look at here on earth, that this is our paradise? So these are the things that I'm kind of like, on the fence with about, I don't know, I, I really wish that I could be like Moses and Abraham and Jehovah would just do a burning bush and talk to me, you know? <laughs> but I feel like he does talk to us. We just don't yeah. always listen. But your video right. was talking about something that your a friend of yours started to kind of, you know, raise the question, raise the eyebrows, and would spark also your new age of ministry. It's um, another, it's another one of, um, on your YouTube channel, Words for Change podcast, and it's finding a community after leaving evangelism. Let's check this out. Made no sense. Like, I grew up with all the answers. Mm -hmm. You ask me a mm -hmm. question, I got the answer. It's black or white, right or wrong. Right. And slowly as I questioned and, and like, hell no longer made eternal conscious torment didn't make sense so maybe just like you suffer for a while and then you cease to exist and it's like i kept baby stepping into this situation like I, okay i can't pray for god to protect me can i is there a god like wow. what is if god is not all-knowing and all-loving and all like if well first of all like if god is all-knowing all-loving and all-powerful i don't like god very much because I'm going to have a hard time worshiping someone or some deity that is less compassionate than I am. Right. So when I when I really put all those together, I'm like, I don't understand how the the hoops that one has to jump through to make that God make sense. Mm. But wow. then I didn't know what made sense right. because everything. Everything. My whole entire, everything. The whole. The, I was. I was. It was completely groundless. Um, completely mm, groundless. God, that sounds like I what have, I went through. It, it's almost like you're standing o over the edge of the Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. and nothing's over you. None, nothing's under your feet. Yeah, like, like you wake up in that dream, and you're like, oh wait, no, and then there's a glass floor. Except there's no glass floor. There's no glass floor. <laughs> oh, and Deborah, I've been there. Com completely groundless. And f stumbling upon someone, like finding out that Carlton Pearson being raised Pentecostal and he's a Christian Universalist. And I'm like, okay, now that I can do. Right, right, right. Yes, huge I can shift. do that. It was huge. Uh, but I still, like, the prayer thing still stumbled. I'm like, I, I can't, I can't. I just couldn't pray. Like, I, I don't believe God can work miracles mm. in the traditional God healed my 
whatever. Are, are, would you consider yourself still on that journey or did you come out of that? And if you did, what got you from that to where you are now? Like, oh. was it books? It just, what, I mean, what was it that did it for you? Like, I just don't, in the traditional healing kind of miracles, I, I guess what I'm at right now, I, and I, I'm, I've got a t-shirt that says, I may not be right, but I know that's wrong. Right. I, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't know that there are completely right answers mm -hmm. to most questions, because most of the time when I would come up with an issue, I would find whatever question it was about prayer or faith or whatever, three great answers, right. all diametrically opposed to the other two answers. Right. Which like is I normal. Hear this answer, which is normal, but not normal in the way we grew up. Right. Uh, at least not me. And the way I grew up, there's only one answer. Right. And and it's either this or that. But now it's like, oh, what I think now is more important is the questions. The question. Woo. She said, she may not be right, but I know what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I mean, listening listening to that now, I haven't listened to it in a while. Okay. But it is it was a, a real, real painful conversation to listen to. Mm. Um, not not for not painful in the sense that I knew how I could feel what she said, and not only because of the words, but because I'd been there, and uh, it just brings back a lot of memories. And and of course, this was her, this is her story it's not my story right. it's her story she was telling her story right but that question of theodicy is mm -hmm. what we call in theology the question of evil where does evil mm -hmm. come from why mm -hmm. does good thing bad things happen to good, good people, people. Mm -hmm. it's kind of what what she really has a struggle with mm -hmm. and that caused her to ask some deeper questions mm -hmm. and i just i think if people can be honest with themselves and begin asking those kind of questions. The question. I think it, yeah, I think it, it kind of what you, you've been saying the whole, the whole show is that, you know, these are the, the honest questions that you are, you feel free to ask mm -hmm. and, and you don't feel like you're being damned by asking those questions. I, I know. think that's, that's a new area of ministry. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Right. I know sometimes when I have the conversation with my partner, you know, I've gotten asked, well, are you questioning your faith or are you doubting your faith? And I think so that's the concern people have sometimes with the question. If I question, does that mean I have doubt? Does that mean and I think what I've been taught is wrong? How about yes? How about everything don't always feel right? And because we didn't question things and we kind of just fell into the pattern of things is why now in, in our 40s or 50s, things don't feel as right as they once did and maybe never really did. The things that I, that I uh, liked about the insert when you described this video, you said that millions of Christians are delusional with evangelism and are looking for a new way or looking to find a new way or new spiritual community because we do want people to understand the importance of church or congregation or temple was so that we can encourage and uplift each other but because of the things that has happened in the church or temple you know now we detached ourselves to that where again we have detached ourselves from like religion people are now I'm not religious I'm spiritual but we're still needing mm -hmm. a community of like-minded individuals because it's still a struggle of not only living a righteous way, but coming into understanding of things that you might have once questioned growing up. Again, not questioning the existence and your relationship with the Creator, but questioning some of the things that man has fed you and the things that man has fed you, what has been fed to them. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah, and you know, L let me let me say this, because I, I just feel like I should say that. Okay. If you are questioning your faith, you're in good company with Jesus. <laughs> okay. If okay. you are questioning your faith, you're in good company with Moses. What you mean? If you're questioning, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Moses doubted. Right. Jesus doubted. Jesus said, "Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me." In other words, I change my mind. Woo. I don't want to go to the cross, okay? Uh, 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 Jonah questioned God. Matter of fact, Jonah said, yeah, I know you called me to be a preacher, but I'm not going to go <laughs> preach to Nineveh. 
right? Yes. So I'm, I'm done with this, right? I can go on and on. Peter questioned Christ. Yes. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know I saw you heal these people, but, you know, you just got arrested, so I'm out. <laughs> okay, so so if you're questioning, okay. you're in good company. Okay. The, the, my issue is people who don't question. Mm. That's my issue, yes. right? So if you're if you're watching this and you are not questioning your faith, then you are you need to question whether or not you actually believe Ooh. what you said you believe. Okay. So <laughs> part of part of growing in faith is it is a progressive experience of faith, a doubt, and, and belief. Hmm. It's an interplay. It's a dance between both of those experiences. It's a, it's a decision to decide to keep going even though the evidence is telling you something quite different. Yes. So, so when I say that you're in good company, I'm saying that, the, that every major church mother and church father in Eastern and Western Christianity have experienced deep moments of doubt, depression, and disengagement mm. from faith. Mm. So if you can understand that, mm -hmm. then you'll understand you're in good company, mm. that, that, that you are going from being brainwashed Hello. to actually believing something, not because somebody told you. Right. So you got me preaching now. You yes, see how you, you better. Turn me up you like better. That? <laughs> you I'm better. sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. You better. But, but it, it, you know, you, you go from a place of, of being dictated to. Yes. To a place of no, I know why I believe this, and yes. I'm and I'm go nothing's gonna change this because of the experiences of doubt that I've been through. Amen. Woo! Yeah, yeah. For check sure, out man. our check out our next PSA, guys. Dear moms and dads, what you have achieved here today is going to help us and our futures. It is why we are coming up on stage to collect your diplomas. You know it's true. Mom, love you always. Everything I do, I do When you graduate, you. they graduate. Visit finishyourdiploma.org to find free and supportive adult education centers near you. You know, a lot of people say, when you're going somewhere, you don't want to look back. <laughs> but I beg to differ. I can't lie and say it was easy. I looked at everything in a different light. I realized it started with me going back and getting my high school diploma. So, Lionel, this is the part of the show where I call the Jesus moment. Oh, this is where, you know, the light bulb <laughs> moment of our discussion. Like, what is, like, your final thoughts? What, what did the spirit move you to kind of share with the audience about this conversation that you and I had today? Yeah, I would say that if you are struggling with doubt and, and disbelief of you're disconnected from a religious community right now, don't worry, don't be afraid. There are many people out here who believe exactly what you believe, right? And they're here to welcome you. You just need to put yourself out there and tell your own truth. Mm -hmm. And once you tell your truth, mm -hmm. You're going to see people come alongside you that you never believe or never imagined thought the way you thought about faith, God, and the church. And, and through that, you're going to find a, a greater sense of community. So just put yourself out there, yeah. tell your truth, and let the Spirit take care of the rest. The beauty in what you said is put yourself out there. And I think, you know, what people get nervous about is I put myself out there, but because I've been hurt by uh, false behavior, you know, it makes me hesitant to share what I think or share how I feel. But the beautiful thing about when we were, when we recall and look to the scriptures, and when we look to the scriptures, when the Apostle Paul asks, oh, excuse me, there wasn't the Apostle Paul, that's a lie, I'm wrong, but when the Apostle John, excuse me, when the Apostle John asks Christ, you know, how will we recognize your people? You know, mm -hmm. uh, we had this conversation, you know, he did not, according to the scriptures, according to what we know, he didn't l make a list of, you know, attributes. He didn't say their color. He didn't say where they came from. He just simply said the love that they show you. So I always encourage people is look for people who show you love, not judgment. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Not telling you, well, why 
why you why you feel this way and, and why you think this way because we have to learn how to meet people where they are. One of the reasons why it's unfortunate that we are in the state that we're looking in is because of how merciful Jehovah is, how merciful Christ is, because he knows that everyone doesn't know. He knows that right. the message hasn't gone to everyone. He knows that people have been misled, lied to, bamboozled, all of that. So he is waiting for, for, for his people, for his children to get the word through all these now new age of ministries from people like you said that look more like us you know I don't I have tats you know I curse surprisingly I didn't curse tonight you know what I'm saying yeah, I'm, I'm like what's up with that <laughs> you know what I'm saying but you know but again you know and, and then I will I have to say you know you got that I know you're barely but you got that warring light skin thing going <laughs> on so you know what I'm saying all the preachers nowadays yeah. don't you know we're not all booted up suited up you know what I'm saying right. so disconnected right. from the people you know what I'm saying mm. we are we mm. we look like the people so we're able right. to reach the people so look for people who look like you also in the messaging and again oh. it's not for you necessarily to now convert but question you know what I'm saying? And that's mm -hmm. what I love about what the sister said in your video. It's really more about the question right now. It's not about, it's no longer about mm -hmm. just being fed whatever it is mm -hmm. because th that's just what it is. So that ties into the inbox question that we have for the week. So we have our Jesus moment and then we have our inbox question. And our inbox question comes from Sadie from Michigan. Sadie from Michigan. And she wanted to know for us as ministers, what has been our most, if we could give one moment of happiness or joy in our ministry, what would that have been? What would that be? Like, can we have a moment of joy where we was like, wow, we made the right decision? Oh, man. Um, the first time I, I, my first, no, it wasn't my first sermon, but I remember preaching in uh, Indiana and man, uh, it was a revival service in, in, uh, I preached and it felt like I wasn't preaching. It felt like somebody was preaching through me. And I remember the pastor afterwards, you know, all these people came to the altar. I mean, it was crazy. And the pastor put his arms around me and cried. And he said, just don't give up. Ooh. That's when I knew that. <laughs> I knew that, you know, <laughs> I've held on to that for years. So that's when I was like, yep, that's it, you know. Wow. For mine's real quick is when my daughter friend at 17 called her to call me so they can do a prayer. And I was mm. like, oh, look at the kids. Look at the kids calling. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> something worked. <laughs> something worked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, so man, I cool. am so appreciative of you, cousin. This was this was a first great virtual introduction, I have to say. Yeah. God is good, baby. God is so good. Yeah. I've enjoyed you. But guess what, everyone? My cousin has his own. I, we took two clips from his 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 podcast today. That's on YouTube, but YouTube is not really your home. Apple is your home where you have right. your weekly podcast. But it doesn't seem like it's weekly. I feel like you're on every other day. Like, what's good? Like, tell tell the folks <laughs> tell the folks how they can hear you. <laughs> and, yeah. So yeah, well, I'm on all the major podcast platforms. So we try to put something out. Uh, uh, every other week, but recently uh, things have changed because we've picked up. And so people are, are, are getting on the show and I'm like, oh man, this is good. You know, I need to put this out now, you know? And so, so typically uh, right now you should find something at least every other week. Uh, that's the consistency. And we usually release a new episode on Tuesday mornings, specific standard time. Uh, but most of my listeners, strangely enough, are on the East Coast. So if you get up at 8 o'clock in the morning while you're on your way to work, you should be able to find some. And now you got some new listeners right here because you got all of New York tuning in. And, you know, because you are where? Because you are not in New York. Uh, yeah, I'm in the Pac Northwest. I'm in Seattle area. Okay. <laughs> also, yeah, that's probably yeah. why I got that call from Michigan today because I had already been <laughs> telling folks that you was coming on. So, again, I am huh. so grateful to you. Thank you for joining in. This was fun. Did you like it? I know you used to, yeah, you know, running yeah, your oh, own I, show. <laughs> yeah, I am used to doing that. But, no, nah, this is cool. I mean, I, I, I'm happy because it's family. That's what I'm happy about. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So on that note, everyone, we're going to take, go, go to a quick, quick, uh, peak. Oh, blah, 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 blah. 
We're going to go to a quick PSA, and then we're going to come back with our spotlight segment. And since that spotlight segment guest is also someone we have to Skype in, we're going to say goodbye to Lionel and once again thank him so much for taking time out of his day and joining me today to co-host this episode of The Next Chapter, where we discuss shades of gray, and we gave you some new age ministry. <laughs> Can I, you, thank you, Lionel. <laughs> Love you. Take care. All right, now. I tell my son I love you every single day. I love you. Oh. Now, my dad has never said that to me. Not because he doesn't love me, but because culturally it wasn't comfortable for him. Now that he's a grandfather, he says I love you to my son every time he sees him. My advice to all the fathers out there, forget the cultural restrictions. They grow up way too fast for you to waste even a single precious moment. Welcome back to the next chapter where we discuss Shades of Grey. I am your host, Minister Cat, a.k.a. Kitty Rose, and you know that this is February. In February, they gave us Black History Month, but you know it's Black History Month all the time on the next chapter. But for Black History Month, I have the wonderful privilege of having a spotlight segment on a wonderful artist that I just became familiar with named, well, before I tell you his name, make mixed media artist DeMarcus, and I'm going to wait to say his last name, but he presents Kindred. So let's bring him on DeMarcus and his exhibition yeah! of Kindred. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> hey, my brother, tell us your last name, baby. <laughs> It's McGoy. Because I be fucking up names, so I didn't want to mess up your name. But celebrating Black History Month, he has a solo art exhibition going on right now. By the time you guys see this show, it's going to be the 18th. You have one more day after seeing this show to actually see his exhibition, but not only see it, go to his artist talk, where he's going to be talking to the public about what his work and what it means to him right now. When I got his bio or his uh, information about this particular ex exhibition, I was told that it's his most intimate and revealing series of work yet. One might describe it as a long walk home. Now, before you say what that means, I recently went to a museum, and me and my boyfriend was like, OK. Like, we didn't know what we were supposed to feel. So when I, did, when I came to your exhibition, and when I saw your images, and when I saw the long walk home, I knew that it was a generational story that you were telling. So what, what am I supposed to feel or what am I supposed to look in this story that you are telling us as a mixed media artist? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kitty. It, um, I guess like, what I'm wanting people to feel is um, feel the sense of migration and feel the sense of family and a sense of hope and a sense of spirituality. Um, like you said, this is the Kindred Exhibition and the six generations of my family, from my mother's side, from my dad's side. And so um, before my grandmother passed away, I was able to go through um, her scrapbook with her. And she was able to narrate the stories on who the people were in the scrapbook. And I've held on to these pictures for like a couple of years. Um, but it wasn't until like when she recently passed away last year, when I really started to dive into this process. And because of that, I think I was originally doing it to create some healing for myself, but in the process, I just kind of fell down the rabbit hole. And so um, I started to realize that, you know, my, my grandmother and my great-grandmother had just like uh, uh, archiving like our family history and just seeing, you know, um, all the different people in my family who lived before I lived. So uh, with mixed media, I'm also using like found objects, I'm using photography, I'm using acrylics and I'm using uh, inherited fabrics. So my grandmother used to also make us quilts and so I also inherited her fabrics. So I put all of those fabrics into the pieces as well. Nice, nice. So I was sent three images. Can you tell us about them? Three images? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is my Aunt Carabelle and this is my great, great grandmother, uh, Pinky Jones. And that is my great grandmother. Um, I call her Big Mama in the purple. So it's actually her scrap, and it's her that's been passed down to her 
and it passed down to my grandmother, which it ended up passing down to me. And this is an image of them standing outside of my my great great grandmother's home. Um, I'm not sure uh, what was actually going on in this picture, but this was a picture <laughs> that I used to grow up looking at. So. But what I loved about it is that they're like three powerful black women, Amen. but um, there's an intimacy in there and of care. And so um, my Aunt Carabelle and then my, my great grandmother, they're actually holding their mother. Ooh. And so um, it just it just shows to me like the love that they that they had to take care of her. And this one is called Home is Where Our Mother Is. Oof. What's the next one, guys? Okay. Uh, this one is Goddess of Faith, um, is what I called it. Um, she actually was unknown in the scrapbook. Um, many of the many of the images had names on the back of the photos, but this one she didn't. But for me, it was her eyes that just really, really spoke to me. And I wanted to create an image or an icon or a spiritual icon um, that catered to like the lessons that I learned when I was a child. And so one of the big things within my family that was taught was like to always have faith a faith the size of a mustard seed. And so this oh, I just wanted to create a spiritual icon on the goddess of faith. And we have one more. Uh, this particular one right here is my great grandfather, Merle McGoy Sr. And um, I grew up always hearing his name around when I lived in Dallas, Texas, I always grew up like hearing his name and all the different things that he did. He migrated to Dallas. He I found out that he was the president of the Black Chamber of Commerce there. Um, and I was a member of that Chamber of Commerce when I lived in Dallas, and I never knew that he was a president. And in the background, all his newspapers with me. So this is a young mm. image of him that I found. And so this is when he boycotted the, he had the Chamber of Commerce boycott the State Fair of Texas when all the African Americans couldn't ride every single ride. So um, I just really love, like, the fact that he saved all his accomplishments and his achievements. I noticed that I am familiar very little with mixed media art because that's where you're able to combine different mediums of art into one, right? So I love correct, the fact correct. that you're using photographs and, and fabrics and, and you're also and painting. Paper. Okay, paper. I'm actually painting as well, too. Nice. The other thing that was in the bio or in your press kit was that you believe that what you create to be portrait and work reveals triumphant tales of African Americans. So you talked about your family because this particular mm -hmm. exhibition is called Kindred. So you're telling the yes. story of your family and I guess the, the success, like you like your uncle uh, and, or, and the women matriarchs holding strong, standing in court. What, did, what does Kindred actually mean? Or what does it mean in description of your art? Um, for me, it means like, um like like uh, related by blood. Um, it means like a, a kindred line, a, a blood line. And so um, again, like what you're seeing is you're seeing like the people who lived before me, like you're seeing the, the people, the experiences, the places that all transpired before I was born. And in actuality, um, the more and more I like really dug into the whole series, it was a, a story before my parents even met. And so I just think about all the different things and all the different people that transpired in order for them to meet, in order for me to be born, and in order for me to be here, you know? So um, I really want to take the time to tell their, their stories. Have you always been an artist? Because you also are a life coach. So is this a new, is this your second life, the next chapter, where you are <laughs> artist from the age of, you know, coming out the womb? Like, have this what you've done your entire life so far? It's a great question. I've, I've always been into the artistic field. As a child, I was always like that kid who could, you know, draw very well in school. Um, but I ran from it because mm. uh, growing up, I didn't have um, positive reinforcements on it. I always heard that to be an artist, like you would be a starving artist or you couldn't be successful with it. And, it, and so I went into the field of graphic design. Ooh. And so um, I ended up starting my own design firm, creating my own publication when I was in Texas and I became a freelance graphic designer okay. when I moved to New York. Um, but I started recently creating art and painting within like the last seven years. Um, a oh. friend of mine passed away. He was a, he's like my accountability partner, my best friend in college. And he went into the fine arts industry. And when he passed away, I felt like it was like him passing me the baton. Wow. And so I started painting for therapy with him. Oh. 
And the life coach thing kind of came about like, um, I think that's kind of always been within me too. Like I've always been a great listener. Okay. Um, even as a child, like um, people always kind of told me, you know, their scenarios and things that were going on with them. But I got asked to be a certified life coach and to, you know, take a course. And I got certified into the course and, you know, I actually apply that in my art. Yes. So really, this is a different, this mixed media style is a, it's a different style than what people are, are, are known for my artwork. Okay. But knowing my artwork, um, what you're seeing is visual representation of life coaching sessions. Nice. So I actually paint my clients and I paint my friends with people that I've actually life coached. Nice. Nice. Okay, now. So I love this because that fits into this show. This is always talking about the next chapters of our life. So even though you have been an artist all your life, this is only seven, eight years. So you a newbie, baby. Okay. So welcome. <laughs> welcome to, to the gallery world and exhibitions. So again, when our audience sees this, it'll be only one day for them to get the opportunity to come out to Brooklyn and see your artist talk. But where are you next? Like, what? Where's Kendrick going next? Um, I'm in the talks with is I have a I have a phone conversation tomorrow. Okay. I can't quite see it yet because it's not ink. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I do have a solo exhibition in Harlem at Kente Royal Gallery. In oh, April. oh, I already know that's happening. So you could talk about okay. it. Oh, it was on the community oh, so board meeting happening. Monday. So. <laughs> okay, that's happening. So that, okay. that'll be between um, April the. 12th through April the 30th. Okay. And then I have a solo exhibition in Dallas, Texas at Disha Boy Gallery in October of 2023. So when you, because if you can't catch him in Brooklyn, then everyone will be able to catch him uptown in Harlem at Kente Harlem. Gallery. But right now, again, you can catch him on the 19th in Brooklyn. He is doing an artist talk of Kindred. Thank you so much, Dem uh, Demarcus, for coming on Thank our show tonight. Me. I so appreciate you. And yeah, man, I wish you continued success telling our stories through mixed media art. Welcome to the world, baby. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. And guys, check him out online. And until that, it's always Black History Month. But hey, check him out and support our local artists doing Black History Month. Thank you so much for joining us. This is your episode. This is the latest episode of The Next Chapter, where we discuss Shades of Grey. Don't forget to like, follow, and share all that good shit. You can always find us and access our questions on our Facebook group page. And until next week, I am your host, Minister Cat, a.k.a. Kitty Rose, and this is the next chapter, guys. I appreciate you. See you next week. Mwah. Be safe out there. Yeah! Man, it's lonely. Like, going through life lonely. There is the therapeutic aspect of music, just expressing how you feel. I'm going to talk to Howie about his feelings and make it into a song. I tell my son I love you every single day. Now my dad has never said that to me. Not because he doesn't love me, but because culturally it wasn't comfortable for him. Now that he's a grandfather, he says, I love you to my son every time he sees him. My advice to all the fathers out there, forget the cultural restrictions. They grow up way too fast for you to waste even a single precious moment. Sharp pains and bellies, all days be heavy when you're programmed to survive. Legendary ciphers get the MCs and the jobs. The city never sleeps, slept for one to five. When COVID hit the block and we had to stay inside. Tough love is all I know, so be gentle with my soul. Learn to navigate winters with no coat. If you never been cold, you never been broke. Hustle 24 7 just to stay afloat. So New York, uh, like dollar pizza in the cold. What oh, shit, that real life break from the Heart of the city is as hard as it gets. This that New York shit, that real life grip from the heart of the city is as hard as it gets. This that New York shit, that real life grip from the heart of the city is as hard as it gets. This that New York shit, that real life grip from the heart of the city is as hard as it gets.